Indonesia, an archipelago nation of over 17,000 islands with a population of around 270 million people. The country is home to hundreds of ethnicities, cultures, languages and religions. Indonesia's wildlife and plant life are among the world's richest and most diverse. Just over half of the country is still covered by forest, including almost 8% of the world's remaining primary forest. Following a severe economic crisis, Indonesia's dictator of over 30 years, Haji Mohamed Suharto, is forced to step down. For decades, the country's very lucrative logging sector has been controlled by Suharto and his cronies. Suharto's personal wealth is believed to be in the region of 38 billion US dollars. Almost overnight, central government's iron grip on the country disappears. The fall of Suwato had created chaos. There was a, a power vacuum as the highly centralised military Javanese dictatorship fell apart with all the very, very hierarchical systems controlled from Java out right across the archipelago. All of that was starting to unravel uh, and there was burgeoning corruption at multiple levels. El Nino causes some of the worst forest fires Indonesia has ever seen. Millions of hectares of forest are destroyed. Alarmed at some of the reports they hear, a small team of British activists from EIA begin a fact-finding mission. We went over to Borneo um, and we were, we were trying to find out what was really going on. It was, there was an El Nino going on, there were fires everywhere, we knew this, um, but why and what was happening and what was being done about it. And, and we drove sometimes for hours across an area that had been thick forest and was now just a, a a mess, it was black, it was uh, dark, you felt, you, you actually felt it as you went through it. It was devoid of any life. The Environmental Investigation Agency is an NGO based in London. Its mission is to protect, respect and celebrate the natural world for the benefit of all. EIA uses a combination of video investigation, advocacy and campaigning to pursue its goals. The forest fires continue to rage. Millions more hectares of forest are destroyed. The impact on people and wildlife is immense. We talked to people about the wildlife in the area of which there wasn't any anymore because it had been burnt out. But they told us of stories of, of orangutans, for instance, that, that would be racing away from the fires to try and escape. And the area is littered with water and rivers and, and canals too that have been built. And if a orangutan comes against water, it can't swim. And so the orangutans were just being burnt to death. And, and the people there, the Dayaks, they felt it was some, the heart of the place had gone, the soul of the place had gone. Back in 1967, Suharto had pushed through a law which transferred control of most of the country's land to the state. I arrived in Indonesia six months after Suwata fell. 
the government of Indonesia invited the UK government to work with it to see what could be done to sort out uh, the problems in the forest sector. Using the forest fires as cover, criminal gangs and timber mafias move into many of the country's national parks. Protected under the Suharto regime, these are places of great beauty, biodiversity and ecological importance. Most are primary forests, abundant with mature hardwoods and established populations of wildlife. Primary forests, also termed primeval, virgin and old growth, are naturally regenerating ancient forests of native tree species. They exhibit advanced and unique ecological features and display few signs of human activity or impact. We were looking by then for a partner and we felt also that we'd met um, in Telepac, an organization that had not just the same ideas in terms of what could go forward, but that we could help with the investigative side and they could help us with understanding how to move forward within Indonesia. Ayo, jalan bareng, kerja bareng, seru-seru. Kupikir itu yang satu-satu, ya, alasan kedua adalah alasan yang misalnya memang kejahatan kehutanan, penghancuran hutan, yang terjadi itu rasanya, rasanya telapak dan EIA bisa berbuat sesuatu. Jadi kami beruntunglah eh, telapak ya yang baru mulai uh, belum tahu apa-apa gitu kan. Terus ketemu terus memperoleh ilmu, memperoleh uh, cara pandang, cara lihat dan cara kerja, keterampilan yang sangat tajam itu. Telepak was founded in Bogor near Jakarta in the mid 90s by a group of students studying environment related subjects. The name translates from Bahasa as footprint. The organization's remit is to advocate for the just and sustainable management of Indonesia's natural resources and to create and sustain a nationwide network of environmentally active people. We decided rather than to go for everything, we would focus on one thing, and that was illegal logging. Telepak has some good up-to-date information about the situation on the ground in central Kalimantan, where this national park called Tanjan Puting, we'd heard was being heavily logged. And the reason we were interested in Tanjan Puting is it was a globally famous uh, nature reserve, and it had a very famous population of orangutans. And we felt that if logging could be so brazen in a place like that, then you know Indonesia's forests would be lost. One of the first joint research trips is to the Tangjung Puting National Park in southern Borneo. Investigators found illegal logging in every part of the park. The area has been divided up by illegal loggers and even trucks are used on roads built by loggers within the park boundaries. Logging rails, used to move the logs out, were discovered throughout the area. Piles of valuable ramen logs are stored along the river, and logging camps litter the riverbank. At the mouth of the river, in full view of the authorities, logs are loaded onto large steel barges. The kingpin in these activities is timber baron Abdul Rasit who owns factories on the nearby Arut River and has close links with the military and police. Mr. Rasit's nephew, Sugianto, showed one of the factories to EIA and Talapak investigators who were posing as businessmen. Part of the Tangjun Linga Company Group, this ramen factory loads unmarked ramen from rafts, dries it in drying rooms and processes it into mouldings and blinds for export to Hong Kong Singapore, Taiwan and the USA. Responding to new information, the team then travel on to the Losa ecosystem in northern Sumatra. EIA and Telepak investigators followed illegal loggers into the national park 
and filmed them preparing their logging camp. Loggers are paid a few dollars per day by the sawmill owners and are supplied the chainsaw and a repayable loan which binds them to these powerful businessmen. Investigators followed logging trucks to the local sawmills. It's the big men that have to be gone after. That's the sawmill owners, the people that own the factories, and those people within the authorities, the military, the police, the forest department, who are also making money out of this. This area has the highest density of orangutans anywhere in the world. The final cut is launched at a press conference in Jakarta. The report and accompanying video investigation stun everyone present and around the country. And the report was very hard hitting, it named names, it did all this kind of stuff. Now they'd never seen that kind of press conference ever before in Indonesia. Remember, it had been a dictatorship. There was oppression about all of that. This was the first time an environmental group had come and given this kind of presentation with the evidence, with the photos, with the video, with the names. And it was so well attended. We had CNN, we had BBC, we had Reuters, we had, we had every, all the, all the big internationals were there, but the locals were there too. A lot of people, certainly those living in the city of Jakarta on Java, had no idea of what was going down in their forests. And, and they were not used to frank, open, conversation and expose of things. And it had a huge impact on them. I think that was the beginning of the a sort of real awakening of some kind of envir environmental awareness, but also a sense that this was their resource and it had been stolen from them. It was a good time for us to be bringing in our, our call for action to the government, and we made it very clear that if you can't take action in Tanjung Putting, then you can't save any forest in Indonesia because Tanjung Putting was so well known and it was so brazen what was going on. It was just outright robbery. Now established as credible and serious players, EIA and Telepak decide to continue their partnership. So the final cut opened doors for us. Um, Telepak and EIA were taken seriously now, were people that knew about these issues. Um, we could talk to diplomatic missions, we could talk to other NGOs, um, we could talk to the media. Uh, we, were, we were a serious part of the game, if you like. Encouraged by the country's growing civil society, the Indonesian government agrees to bilateral talks with the UK aimed at combating illegal logging. Lalu dari David, ya, saya ingat, saya lupa namanya, oke okay, kita kembangkan proyek kerjasama. Lebih baik kita melakukan kerjasama daripada saling mencela. Several newly formed NGOs from around Indonesia contact EIA and Telepak, asking to be trained in their methods of on-the-ground video investigation. We realised that the training that we could give to groups all around the country would motivate them, would mobilise them um, in their own way, for their own issues, um, for a long time to come. The NGOs develop and roll out a series of basic field training workshops. We sort of go out to the regions and bring together you know, 10 or 15 local NGOs and we show them basic um, use of photography and film and some undercover techniques and, and safety and security, which would embolden them and give them the skills they needed to, to start campaigning against illegal, illegal logging in, in their areas. And because Telepak had such a fantastic network of people over the country, it was going to prove over the years to come um, a vital part of information coming in, photographs coming in, video coming in. Over the next eight years, EIA and Telepak run many similar and more advanced training courses for NGOs all around the country. It wasn't just about learning how to use a camera. It had opened up all kinds of possibilities in the minds of the youth uh, participants in these workshops about what they could do with their lives. 
As Indonesia's new president gets to grips with the job, he makes the decision to devolve significant powers to the regions. Saya sudah bilang tadi ya, korupsi itu ada di mana-mana, nepotisme, kolusi gitu ya, pelanggaran hukum dibiarkan sehingga otonomi daerah ini alih-alih bisa menjadi perbaikan. Tapi yang terjadi adalah semakin merebaknya KKN ini, praktek KKN ini bahkan sampai di level yang paling rendah gitu sehingga kita tadinya punya um, raja-raja koruptor cuma ada di Jakarta tapi sekarang hampir di setiap provinsi kabupaten ada CITES is an international treaty signed by most of the world's governments it aims to prevent animal and plant species becoming endangered or extinct through trade the NGOs have an appointment to meet the new Minister of Forestry. I wanted a commitment from him that he would um, unilaterally list Ramin on CITES Appendix 3. And I explained to him, by doing this, there would be some oversight, there'd be some regulation, there'd be something there um, that would exist to be able to try and control this hemorrhaging of, of, this, of this valuable timber from the park. And he agreed. The government announces a moratorium on the logging of ramen. And a few months later, as agreed by the minister, lists ramen on Appendix 3 of CITES. The Malaysian government responds by submitting a reservation. A reservation is a mechanism enabling a CITES member country not to observe or comply with part or all of an Appendix 3 listing. Ramen trees grow in the coastal peat swamp forests of Borneo, Sumatra and Peninsular Malaysia. Since the 60s, Malaysia's timber industry has been based on the logging and processing of ramen, a strong blonde hardwood. Malaysia's annual available supply of ramen for processing has reduced by around 80% in the last 10 years. Despite this, however, exports of ramen from Malaysia, sawn timber and finished products have increased significantly in the last couple of years. Of course, they suddenly had a good supply of cheap, illegal timber coming across from neighbouring Indonesia. By 2001, we were very keen to follow the trail the ramen trail, you might call it, for the ramen that's been illegally logged in Indonesia. We knew a lot of that was being smuggled into neighbouring Malaysia. Malaysia had a very big timber industry and ramen was a key species in that. So we decided to start looking at the, 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 the supply chain and the, and the smuggling routes that ramen was, was taking to get from Indonesia to Malaysia. After 18 months of investigations and months of putting the information together, EIA and Telepak release a follow-up report. On just one day, EIA and Telapak investigators witnessed more than 30 Indonesian vessels carrying illegal logs arriving in the port of Muar in Malaysia. The boats were seen passing a police post and stopping at a customs jetty, once again showing official complicity. In Batu Pahat, EIA and Telapak investigators found ramen logs which had recently been imported from Sumatra in Indonesia. Such trade is illegal under the CITES listing and illustrates that Malaysia continues to flout its international obligations. The scale was just mind-blowing in a way and it was all being done in the open. There was no attempt to be clandestine, which shows that you know, the Malaysian authorities weren't willing to act on this because their businesses were profiting from the destruction of neighbouring Indonesia's forests. Given the fact that CITES had just listed Indonesian ramen on CITES Appendix 3, and we were actually completely shocked at the fact that nothing had changed. But also in terms of economics, this sudden glut of ramen that was being smuggled via Malaysia was depressing the price on the international market because it's simple oversupply. In part as a result of the work of EIA, Telepak and others, some governments around the world start to grasp the scale and seriousness of the explosion in illegal logging, 
and the destruction of the world's remaining forests. At the time, the World Bank were organising a whole series of, I don't know, rather staid technocratic meetings on forest law enforcement. Uh, and I thought, this is an opportunity, you know, to really, if we could jump on these, get hold of the agenda, uh, we could change these into real game-changing uh, dialogues and discussions with the real actors. Together with the Americans, I have to say, we managed to add the word governance, forest law enforcement governance, to the title. The East Asia Ministerial Conference on Forest Law Enforcement and Governance opens in Bali. Hosted by the Indonesian government and the World Bank, and part funded by DFID and USAID, 150 delegates from 20 countries arrive in Denpasar. They represent NGOs, governments, UN agencies and the private sector. The stage is set for significant change. And we managed to get high-level segment, uh, where consumer countries like the UK and the US and Europe would send high-level representation, because we reckon we were part of the problem, as well as top-level uh, government officials from Indonesia, from China, and to have a large, um, a large participation of civil society organisations. The delegates are gathered for several days of discussion and debate on the future of Southeast Asia's remaining forest. At the end of the first day of the conference, uh, we were sitting around in a bar discussing what had happened that day and where we thought things could go forward. And suddenly on the TV screens, uh, we witnessed what people all over the world were witnessing, um, which was the Twin Towers coming down. It was 9-11. And uh, uh, we were shocked, absolutely shocked. Almost immediately, the Indonesian police arrive. They surround and seal off the conference hotel to protect the delegates inside. And so, at that moment, it was decided that the high-level segment would be pulled forward, uh, we would shorten the conference, uh, but that no one would abandon the conference. Indeed, none of us were able to leave the hotel anyway for the next 24 hours. Uh, and so uh, the conference carried on. In the spirit of global unity, all but one of the participating countries, including China, sign a declaration of undertaking an intent on forest law enforcement and governance. It becomes known as FLEG. Malaysia refuses to sign. So the conference went way beyond trees. It was to actually address the core issues of corruption, land rights, tenure. It was looking at illegal trade, illegal logging, but it went way beyond the trees. And that was really significant. By having these issues out in the open, we are actually getting governments to acknowledge that there was a problem in the first place. A couple of months later, the Indonesian government implements a log export ban. From this point onwards, only sawn or processed timber can legally be exported from the country. This was definitely good news, um, but as with all these things, would it be enforced would be the question. Uh, the big problem and the big loophole in all of this was that although this ban was for exports from Indonesia, it was still legal for Malaysia to import the logs. Can I welcome everybody to this uh, signing ceremony? The UK and Indonesia sign the Memorandum of Understanding. They've been negotiating for over two years. The purpose of the MOU is to cut, or curtail, any involvement that the UK might have in the destruction of Indonesia's remaining forests. The MOU was a great idea. And what it was, was the UK saying, look, Indonesia, you don't have to do this on your own. You know, the UK was part of the problem as well. And that MOU basically provided a way forward to look at this issue from both ends. <laughs> However, the MOU also includes some aspects of trade. And this 
put the European Union's nose out of joint. Trade is a European Union issue and responsibility, not a member state responsibility at that time. However, it obliged them to engage and to look at what they would do to control the illegal timber coming into their bigger area from uh, tropical forests across the world, including Indonesia. Embarrassed by further video investigations by EIA, Telepak and others, Malaysia's federal government introduces a ban on the import of logs from Indonesia. Dan ini sebetulnya merupakan uh, cikal bakal atau salah satu contoh di mana negara konsumen dan negara produsen bekerja bersama gitu loh mempunyai uh, legislasi yang saling melengkapi untuk mengatasi uh, illegal logging dan perdagangan kayu ilegal antar negara atau cross border. From their network of NGO contacts around the country, information reaches Telepak that the timber mafias are now targeting Indonesia's Papuan provinces on the island of New Guinea. Indonesia's Papuan forests were an obvious place for the timber mafia to go to next because here you had huge stands of ancient forests, you had valuable hardwoods available, very little control of The area for them just must have felt like an open book to make money. EIA and Telepak traveled south of Sarong City, a day's journey by speedboat and on foot, to the home of the Kanasimos tribe, to witness the impact of logging on traditional communities. In three locations in the Kunasimos tribal lands, illegal merbau logging is taking place against the wishes of the community. Damage to the forest from logging roads is clear to see. EIA and Telepak observed large merbau logs awaiting collection, clearly illegal. Dan untuk lingkungan ini, perasaan untuk melihat lingkungan itu sebagai bagian yang harus dihancurkan memang tidak. Itu termasuk rumah tangga yang besar. Hubungan atau ya hubungan sebagai kearifan masyarakat adat dengan alam itu sangat menjadi kebanggaan masyarakat. Dan eh, tatanan kehidupan masyarakat adat di sini melihat bahwa kekayaan alam yang ada itu menjadi aset utama. Sehingga di dalam pengolahannya itu sangat sederhana. What's happening is corruption is moving in, the military are involved, the police are involved. And what's needed is that the governor of Papua actually investigates what's happening with this corruption, with the military, with the police. Staying with the Kanaimas tribe that we stayed with in the village um, was an extraordinary feeling. It didn't take long to really feel the, the wonderful sense of, of how that community lived as such a close-knit, caring, loving community. It, it rubbed off very heavily on us. In part due to the work of EIA, Telepak and others, Western governments and consumers begin expressing concerns regarding the legality of available tropical hardwoods. Indonesia's legitimate timber industry decides to join Telepak's initiative to define the legality of timber. Pada tahun 2003, diskusi-diskusi seperti ini semakin banyak terjadi karena semua pihak merasa bahwa langkah awal untuk bisa menanggulangi permasalahan illegal logging adalah kejelasan terlebih dahulu. Gitu loh. Ma mana yang kayu legal, mana yang ilegal. Sehingga penegakan hukum bisa berlangsung efektif dan juga um, apa namanya um, para pelaku usaha punya panduan yang jelas bagaimana melakukan uh, usahanya. 
As the talks get underway, the parties involved realize how very far apart their interests lie. Perdebatannya itu sangat hangat dan bahkan kalau mau bisa dibilang panas gitu ya. Itu betul-betul uh, head to head antara terutama antara um, uh, private sector gitu industri dan uh, pihak uh, masyarakat sipil. In a further attempt to reduce supplies of its ramen to Malaysia, the Indonesian government submits a request to CITES ahead of its annual meeting that ramen be upgraded from Appendix 3 to Appendix 2. In support, EIA and Telepak hurriedly compile and release the ramen racket. So we set out to create a really compelling document which would help made the argument, so we pulled together all the information on ramen dating back to you know, the, the late 90s in Tanjung Putting and the trade in Malaysia, all the things that we gathered over those years. CITES considers the issue and moves ramen to Appendix 2. This declares ramen to be potentially threatened and regulates legal trade in the species. The Malaysian government responds by declaring the move unnecessary. From trusted contacts in West Papua, information reaches the NGOs of a significant increase in the number of merbau trees being illegally logged and then illegally shipped to China. Within days, the team returns to Sarong, intent on tracing the illegal export of the timber. EIA and Telepak's report reveals how shadowy international networks are conspiring to steal huge amounts of valuable merbau logs from Indonesia and smuggling the contraband to China using false Malaysian documents, often with the complicity of the Indonesian authorities. With huge cargo ships arriving daily, it is a trade of breathtaking scale and destructiveness. Merbau logs are the most common timber found at the port. This luxurious, dark hardwood is used in the manufacture of flooring. In the last five years, hundreds of factories have sprung up in Nanshun, churning out thousands of kilometres of merbau wood flooring. There are over 200 sawmills in the town processing merbau logs, the vast majority of which have been stolen from Papua. The Shanghai-based firm Sihi Wood revealed to EIA and Telepak undercover investigators that they regularly export merbau flooring to the UK, Canada and the USA. Mm. For merbau, I think every month we export about uh, 20,000, 20, 25,000, I think. 25,000 yeah. square metres. The massive illegal trade in Merbau between Indonesia and China is threatening the last pristine forest in the Asia-Pacific region. While a chain of brokers and middlemen are earning vast profits, the communities of Papua are being robbed to feed China's rapacious timber industry. Lembaga Investigasi Lingkungan atau EIA mengungkapkan Papua The Last Frontier makes headlines around the world and dominates the news agenda in Indonesia for several days. Lembaga Investigasi Lingkungan yang berbasis di London, EIA dan Telapak di Indonesia. There's widespread public anger that the country's forests are being illegally destroyed by domestic timber mafias and sold to China at discount prices. The president requests a copy of the report and video investigation and calls an emergency cabinet meeting. He then addresses the nation. Kejahatan illegal logging juga sangat meresahkan. Instruksi saya singkat dan jelas. Selamatkan hutan kita, hukum para penebang dan pencuri kayu secara liar itu. From the capital Jakarta, the president dispatches a military task force of 1,500 personnel to Sarong. The task force confiscates huge stores of illegally logged merbau, 
and stops all pending illegal exports to China, where the lack of supply causes the price to double. So from a campaigning point of view, the impact of the Last Frontier report was better than we could have ever anticipated. We expected something, but we didn't expect something so dramatic and so quick, which basically marked a turning point in Indonesia's struggle against illegal logging. As international consumer demand for tropical hardwoods continues to boom, the West grapples with the ongoing issue of trying to determine the legality of wood and wood products arriving at its ports. The European Union adopts the Forest Law Enforcement, Governance and Trade Regulation, also known as FLEG-T. It's based on the principles of the Bali Declaration. The regulation introduces voluntary partnership agreements, bilateral arrangements with individual countries relating solely to timber. The purpose of EU VPAs is to ensure that timber and timber products exported to the EU originate only from legal sources. VPAs also aim to improve forest governance and law enforcement. As far as we were concerned, we could see that this was a really positive thing. It was something where you had the private sector, the government, civil society coming together to come with some solutions to reform, to build. Ahead of the VPA negotiations between the European Union and Indonesia, EIA and Telepak are invited to Brussels to brief a group of concerned MEPs and EU officials. Accompanying them is Fred Sagisolo of the Kanasai Mos people in West Papua. Indonesia's ambassador to the EU and other interested parties also attend. And he absolutely landed in terms of being able to bring home the reality of the situation and what needed to be done. Far better that than me speaking on their behalf or another report landing on their desk. Back in Indonesia, the NGOs return to West Papua to follow up on the final frontier. Two years on, none of the major criminals behind the pillage of Papua have been convicted. Most of those arrested have been freed by the courts. One of those arrested was an influential police officer called Martin Renner. He was caught red-handed with over 100,000 US dollars in his bank account from companies involved in illegal logging. Incredibly, the court let him walk free. Hasil akhirnya ini sangat mengecewakan. Yang ini sebetulnya menandakan bahwa memang untuk penegakan hukum dan proses judicial di Indonesia itu masih sangat lemah. Although the situation in Indonesia had improved after the Last Frontier report, it was in some ways a challenging and quite frustrating time as well because the people we were exposing the main timber barons and their accomplices, they weren't facing any legal action. They were able to act with impunity. Information from contacts in Sumatra prompts the NGOs to undertake a new investigation. In Riau province, investigators found smuggling to be rife, especially in the Gaong River area. Whilst there, they were shown an unusual smuggling technique. Most of the timber, stolen from Rio, makes the short journey across the Malacca Straits to Malaysia, where the company, Li Beng Ko, is one of the main dealers in stolen wood. 
你来是飞牌的无？印尼偷来是飞牌的，我那是偷偷改买的无？哦，啊，印尼政府贵在袂得出口这个物件。So this was a really difficult time. Every time we thought we'd got somewhere, we would find that there was even more going on and it just got bigger and bigger. And it was really overwhelming, you know? But then we suddenly pulled ourselves together because it's like, you're not just looking at logs coming from a park and going from A to B. These were syndicates. These were whole syndicates of criminals who were involved on a long chain, if you like, of, of illegal custody of timber. It was crossing borders. It was looking at different politics. It was dealing with completely different levels of enforcement even. And the corruption, the corruption was just rife throughout. In the US, the government amends the existing Lacey Act to include plant species. The act was first passed in 1900 to prevent wildlife being illegally imported into the federal union. So the US Lacey Act prohibits the trade in plants and plant products that have been illegally sourced from a foreign country. It also requires companies that are importing goods to declare the country of origin and the species name of any plants in their products. And finally, it also establishes a penalties regime, which includes forfeiture of goods and vessels and fines and potentially jail time as well. Back in Indonesia, the government announces plans to almost triple the size of its palm oil industry. Five million hectares of the country's heavily forested Papuan provinces are designated to be cleared and converted to palm oil plantations. Ini sangat mengkhawatirkan, meskipun sebetulnya tidak mengejutkan. Dan pemerintah tentu saja ingin memanfaatkan perkembangan ini untuk meningkatkan pendapatan negara. Cuma ini juga artinya ancaman yang sangat besar terhadap keberadaan hutan Indonesia terutama di Papua dan juga ancaman terhadap masyarakat adat dan masyarakat lokal yang hidupnya bergantung pada hutan. From this point onwards, EIA and Telepak operate a dual focus in Indonesia. They continue their work against illegal logging of high-value species and they undertake a new campaign against the massive clearance of forests for palm oil plantations. The NGOs decide to dispatch a team to West Papua to look into the current situation there. Terpaksa suami saya ikut ikut tanda tangan dalam surat perusahaan itu tanda tangan untuk serakan kelapa sawit. Saya punya nyong yang kecil juga, dia juga ikut tanda tangan dari perusahaan. Dia ikut tanda tangan dia umur sejak empat tahun. Dulu tuh di sini tuh masih hutang semua. Di sini masih hutang. Tapi sekarang ini su tidak hutang lagi. Sekarang kami lihat saja lah dorang tanam kelapa sawit saja. Hutang su tidak ada. Tapi saya biasa kasih tahu untuk kami punya keluarga yang lain-lain. Saya bilang jangan kalau perusahaan kelapa sawit ini masuk di areal kamu, kamu jangan ambil, jangan terima. So land rights in Indonesia are very often contentious. There are indigenous customary land rights, which are long-standing rights of local indigenous people. And then there are the rights that the state establishes for itself through the law. And there is always a contention and confusion in navigating those two systems of rights. Since decentralization back in 2000, Regional governments have been mostly responsible for managing forest and land-related permits and licenses. 
dengan tanpa gafran yang baik maka izin-izin yang diberikan oleh bupati itu dan tanpa kontrol ya lalu konversi hutan besar-besaran dari hutan bagus dan proses tata ruang menjadi hutan konversi kegiatan ekologi merebak. Palm oil plantation licenses are normally issued by local governments after a company has approached them seeking land and seeking to invest. Very often there is little consultation with local people. There's, the decision has been made at that provincial or, or regional level um, and local people are, can be unaware or often do not consent to these things, but the plantation will proceed regardless and the permits will be issued. However, if an area of targeted forest is already officially designated as state forest, the permit application to cut it down and convert the land to a palm oil plantation must be approved by central government in Jakarta, specifically by the Ministry of Forestry. It's the one point where they could intervene and prevent it happening, but that rarely happens. And normally permits are issued and the land is cleared and the forest is, is destroyed. After six years of talks to define the legality of timber, agreement is finally reached between Indonesia's civil society, timber industry and government. Karena prosesnya berlangsung bertahun-tahun dan cukup um, intensif waktu itu, pada akhirnya seluruh stakeholder bisa memahami posisi masing-masing, masing-masing pihak dan dapat uh, bernegosiasi dan melakukan um, apa namanya kesepakatan-kesepakatan. The Indonesian government passes the timber legality verification system into law. It becomes known as the SVLK. SVLK ini sendiri uh, sebetulnya merupakan salah satu terobosan karena di sistem verifikasi atau sistem um, yang mandatori ini untuk pertama kalinya peranan masyarakat sipil diakui secara formal sebagai pemantau dari sistem ini. Ini merupakan salah satu keberhasilan uh, dari advokasi masyarakat sipil Indonesia sehingga proses check and balances di dalam sistem ini bisa dijaga. The voluntary partnership agreement between the European Union and Indonesia is at last negotiated and ready to be signed into law. This means that Indonesia will be eligible to use the EU's Flag T licensing system when it comes online. Di dalam Flag T VPA, negara produsen memastikan bahwa uh, ia hanya mengirim kayu-kayu legal ke pasar Uni Eropa. You know, people say VPAs take way too long. When you actually look at what is being achieved here, you're looking at reforming entire systems, building new institutions. You're actually giving time for people to put their ideas and suggestions forward. You're talking about having meetings with governments and civil society, trade. You're talking about bringing people together so that they can come up with these solutions and own it. And so, yeah, it will take a long time, but it's an extremely positive process. To level the playing field, Indonesia's government, civil society and others ask the European Union to introduce its own legislation, prohibiting the import of illegally logged timber and timber products from anywhere in the world. Back in Indonesia, the president announces a temporary moratorium on the cutting down of primary forests and the clearing of virgin peatlands. The moratorium covers an area of 64 million hectares. Instruksi presiden mengenai moratorium pemberian izin di uh, kawasan hutan primer dan lahan gambut ini merupakan satu langkah yang patut diapresiasi. Meskipun sebetulnya um, akan lebih baik lagi jika uh, perlindungan ini diberikan kepada seluruh hutan alam.
Brussels introduces the European Union Timber Regulation. The EUTR, as it becomes known, prohibits illegally harvested timber or timber products from anywhere in the world being imported into the EU. Though separate, the EUTR and the forthcoming EU VPA Fleg T licensing system exist in parallel. Under the European Union timber regulation, importers must demonstrate the ownership of the timber from the point it was cut down to the point it arrives in Europe. They must show that it was harvested legally and they must show that specific laws were upheld in the transport of the timber to Europe. Since leaving the European Union, the UK has continued to implement the regulation, renaming it the UKTR. Terbitnya EU Timber Regulation um, itu bisa dikatakan sebuah kemenangan bagi semua pihak yang memang menginginkan negara konsumen mengambil tanggung jawabnya dalam isu perdagangan ilegal kayu dan produk kayu. Karena membatasi hak masyarakat hukum adat untuk memanfaatkan hasil ke kekayaan alam yang berada di wilayah adatnya. In a case brought by the Indigenous Peoples Alliance, Indonesia's constitutional court overturned Suharto's 1967 law, which transferred control of most of the country's land to the state. The ruling clears a legal path for indigenous peoples to reclaim their ancestral or customary lands. Ini sebetulnya keputusan yang sangat uh, luar biasa karena artinya negara mengakui hutan adat di dalam wilayah adat. Sayangnya menyusul putusan MK 35 ini Langkah yang diambil pemerintah untuk mengakui hutan adat ternyata uh, membuat pelaksanaannya sangat sulit. Across Indonesia, some palm oil companies are using the government's drive to hugely expand the sector as a license to act with impunity. Banyaknya penebangan uh, atau penebangan ilegal atau ada adanya ilegal logging dilakukan oleh perkebunan persawi. Dari awal tidak ada uh, perkebunan yang benar di kalangan tetangga yang masuk. Mereka membuka lahan, ada yang berkedok izin yang uh, uh, cuma sekian, tapi besarannya dua kali lipat dari izin tersebut. Dan juga mereka menebang hutan-hutan di dalam konsesi itu, baik pun konflik tenorial, konflik dengan masyarakat. Perusahaan-perusahaan kelapa sawit yang bisa membuka dan menebangi hutan dalam jumlah yang luas sebahkan sebelum izinnya beroperasi atau yang izinnya keluar dari proses-proses yang korup um, ini tentu saja kemudian um, menghasilkan kayu-kayu yang tidak sah juga atau ilegal dan um, ini menjadi modus baru sebetulnya dalam um, pembalakan liar yaitu dengan menggunakan izin kelapa sawit untuk membuka hutan Dan um, sepanjang proses pemberian izin yang syarat korupsi itu tidak diperbaiki atau tidak diatasi, masalah ini akan selalu ada. Akan ke situ. Jadi uh, salah satu syarat. Tapi juga ada syarat. Following a change in leadership, Telepak alters its direction. To preserve the focus, values and ideals of the original organization, most of the founders and nationwide membership leave and form a new NGO, which they call Kaum Telepak.
Japan introduces the Clean Wood Act, which specifies that all wood and wood products entering the country must have been harvested legally. Fifteen years after the Bali Conference, six years on from the timber legality verification system becoming law in Indonesia, and two years after the European Union and Indonesia sign their voluntary partnership agreement, the EU's Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Licensing System, also known as FLEG-T, finally comes online. FLEG-T licensed products from Indonesia are free to sail straight into Europe's ports and then travel around the rest of the Union, while similar products from neighbouring countries are delayed as they need to prove due diligence and can be refused entry. Yang menurut kami kalau ini menunjukkan juga bahwa dengan adanya political will dari pemerintah, partisipasi penuh dari para pihak dan proses yang transparan dan akuntabel, reformasi di sektor kehutanan bisa dicapai. The licensing was really important for quite a lot of things, but firstly, after all the hard work and slog that it had taken all this time, Indonesia had stayed with that commitment and landed, and there they were with the license. Secondly, they were the first country in the world, actually, but more importantly in the region, to um, have got a flag tea license. This really helped drive the other countries who were looking at BPAs in moving forward in what they wanted. But thirdly, and more importantly, I suppose, to Indonesia, it meant that the value of their furniture and wood products into the EU market grew. South Korea revises its legislation on the sustainable use of timber to prevent unverified wood entering the country. The President of Indonesia introduces a three-year moratorium on the issuing of permits for new palm oil plantations. And a year later, he makes permanent the moratorium on the cutting down of primary forest and the clearing of virgin peatland. Keputusan Presiden untuk memberlakukan moratorium pemberian izin di hutan primer dan lahan gambut menjadi permanen itu sangat kami apresiasi. Meskipun idealnya perlindungan ini dikeluarkan dalam bentuk produk hukum atau kebijakan, bukan sekedar instruksi presiden. China, the world's largest importer of timber, amends its forestry law to ban the purchase, process or transport of illegally sourced wood. In 2019, over a billion euros worth of EU Flag T licensed timber and timber products from Indonesia are seamlessly imported into the European Union. Ini sebetulnya merupakan prestasi besar bagi Indonesia. Artinya, um, karena dulunya Indonesia dikenal sebagai negara dengan tingkat illegal logging tertinggi, kami di kaum telapak merasa bangga bahwa kami merupakan bagian dari proses ini. The latest Indonesian government statistics reveal that annual deforestation has fallen to its lowest level since records began in 1990. In 2019, 150,000 hectares of forest were destroyed, compared to a high of almost 1.1 million hectares in 2014. The government says this huge drop is due to the combined successes of its anti-deforestation policies. NGOs add that the falling price of palm oil and the global COVID crisis have also contributed to the low figure. Dengan perbaikan tata kelola di sektor kehutanan, hutan Indonesia bisa terlindungi dan um, livelihood atau penghidupan masyarakat yang bekerja di sektor kehutanan dan industri kayu itu bisa meningkat. Throughout Indonesia, much has improved, but in the palm oil sector, some instances of bad practice continue. Kenapa Pak yang dipaksa-paksa begini Pak? Apa masalahnya? Ayo, 
bukan penjata. Bapak itu di rumah. Saya berani pastikan ini memang acara cara perusahaan untuk membungkam kami. Nah, membungkam kami sehingga kami uh, jangan melakukan perlawanan. Artinya harus turuti kehendak mereka. Karena sebelumnya ada empat orang uh, teman saya yang sudah di, duluan ditangkap. Di kampung ini mana orang-orang yang tidak pro mereka memang mereka upaya untuk dikriminalisasi untuk membungkam perjuangan kami mempertahankan hutan adat ini. Hutan kami ini hilang karena di, uh, perkebunan sawit ini. Nah, jadi dengan adanya pembukaan perkebunan dengan skala besar ini, uh, dia menghilangkan semuanya. Nah, baik tumbuhannya, hewannya, apapun yang kami perlukan di tanah ini ya semuanya hilang. Nah, sementara itu yang kami mampu, kami perlukan bukan cuma untuk kehidupan ekonomi juga untuk kehidupan spiritual dan sebagainya. Dari keseluruhan wilayah adat kita ini 16.300 hektar itu yang sudah tergarap perkiraan sekitar 2.000 hektar. Nah, secara ekonomi yang kita rasa kita hilang uh, usaha, usaha masyarakat yang dulunya misalnya berburu, mencari bahan-bahan di hutan, mencari makanan, mencari ikan, ini sudah mulai terasa. Itu yang sayang sekali dan sedihnya justru akhir-akhir ini justru semakin banyak e, aktivis lingkungan atau aktivis hak e, masyarakat e, yang memperoleh e, intimidasi, ancaman, bahkan kekerasan, mengalami kekerasan baik secara fisik maupun secara hukum maupun secara e, media. The global production of poorly regulated commodities such as palm oil, soy and beef is the major driver of the deforestation of our planet. 1.6 billion people, around 20% of the global population, rely on forests for part or all of their livelihoods. The Earth's remaining forests cover about 30% of the planet's land mass and are home to around 80% of animal and plant species. As temperatures rise and pressures mount, governments around the world are drafting new laws aimed at reducing deforestation in the commodity supply chain. The world's remaining forests are the planet's last defense against its greatest threat, accelerated climate change. Every day, as EIA, Kaum Telepak, and many others around the world go to work, on the ground and in the capitals of power, they do so determined to develop new solutions, to slow down deforestation, and to do whatever they possibly can to save the world's remaining forests. Our survival, and the survival of our planet, depend on it.